At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce the president of JFK Lancer, a person who's devoted her energy and her passions to a cause greater than a single individual, drawing attention to the great injustice and the profound tragedy of the intervention which changed the course of our lives. It's my pleasure to introduce Deborah Conway. Good evening, everyone. Um, let's give a big round of applause for this wonderful meal that we're eating tonight. It's very easy to choose the menu each year. I just say, you know what, we want beef. We're in Texas, we gotta have beef. <laughs> I'm very, very honored to take uh, this time to talk to you about our next speaker. I guess it's been quite a few years ago that I was on the internet and I was just kind of scooting around pre-Google. I think I was probably on Yahoo or something ancient as I am on there. And I came across a website that had a lot of Kennedy campaign buttons and uh, images and things. And I thought, wow, this is a really cool site. Look, who's doing this? And so I started looking around, and lo and behold, I realized that this was uh, someone named Carrie McCarthy. And I thought, McCarthy? Wait, that, you know, well, that sounds familiar. Wait, I think there's some Kennedy family people that have that name. And I started looking in books and things, and I got really, really excited. And then there was another name on there, Cheryl, and... Uh, I said, well, you know what? I'm kind of nervous to write to this other person. I think I'm going to write to Cheryl. And I did. <laughs> and come to find out, she was part of the household of this, these wonderful people that I've come to be friends with and, and love and, and care for so much. And I, I can't tell you enough what it means to me, not just the character of Cheryl, and Carrie, and, and now meeting some more of the family, Kevin, um, that they take this time out of their lives to be with us, not only this weekend, but, but many times. And, I, and the late night phone calls that she lets me rant and rave and stomp around when I'm mad at something that's in the media that didn't go my way, and, and she listens. And I can't thank both of you enough for listening all these years and keeping me in a good frame of mind, keeping me from wanting to stomp off into the sunset. Um, and I tell you, there's, there's lots of people that I've met, a lot of witnesses that were in Dealey Plaza, a lot of you that have been researchers that have touched my heart, a lot of authors that have written books that I'll, I'll never be able to forget. But there's nothing like meeting someone that's in the Kennedy family, that has that voice, that stature, that sense of, of uh, honor, and that sense of stewardship to this country. And one of my favorite Kennedys of all is Carrie McCarthy, and I'd like to share her with you tonight. Carrie. I'm so delighted she said my name because I started to stand up and thought she could know a better Kennedy. I don't know. But I'm sorry you all are stuck with me tonight, obviously. And I am honored to be here. When I arrived yesterday, I went directly to the sign-in area in the conference. And I think, I think I had a badge, but they were so busy I kind of backed off because I was embarrassed. Because it's you all that make the conference, and I'm well aware of that. But when I saw Deborah, I asked her what day I would speak and what was my topic. And she said, well, the banquet, of course. And just tell everybody what a whirlwind it is to be in your family, and walked off. And I thought, uh oh, OK, no pressure. I thought I was doing one of the little breakout rooms, you know, where I would tell little stories. So I'm very honored to be with you all tonight. And I'll do the best I can, Deborah. and thank you for your lovely introduction, honey. 
At 2 a.m. this morning when I started making notes to meet Deborah's requirements, I thought of the story our host, Alan Dale, had shared with me yesterday. And Alan, I'm so glad my cousin Jack had the good sense to protect your lovely mother and you from the crush of the crowds at a political event in 1959. From a vulnerable one-month-old to a man now helping to bring to all, you bring us together to remember that candidate who went on to become our president. Thank you very much, your favorite president. And your path has become fascinating. I'm honored to share the stage with you tonight, truly. I'm also equally honored to have the opportunity to join you all in both meeting and hearing our keynote speaker because I feel that Jeff represents the best that we could hope for this evening. He is not only renowned and definitely a respected journalist whose search for the story obviously must always include honesty and an example that he sets for his profession that once was an absolute. Jeff, thank you very much. And thank you for chef sharing Andy at our table. We've tried not to embarrass him too much with our nonsense. And I noticed, Beverly, you stayed away from him. That was good. You shouldn't, don't be sitting on the young men's laps right away. <laughs> we didn't have a chance to really get to know him. Maybe an encore later. We'll see what we can do. To our chairs, to both Larry and to Stu, thank you. And congratulations to all the award winners, because I remember the night that I won mine. Deborah was very coy, saying that was all done. And I thought, I've been coming a few years. For God's sakes, I should be up for something. We're competitive in my family. I need something. And then she awarded it to me when I was out of the room. So honorees, stay put, really, because it goes so quickly, you won't believe. I do think that the authors and the writers, the speakers, the video production specialists, all of you make this event special because each of you brings your specialty. And in life, I long learned a good, a good lesson. When someone is good at something, say congratulations or say thank you. Because not all of us will be good at everything, and we're blessed if we're good at one thing. The people that share their gifts are the ones that we depend on in life. I want to begin tonight by making an acknowledgement of my appreciation to all of the volunteers and the staff of JFK Lancer for your exhaustive work to make this weekend special, hopefully for all of us. I wonder, Steve, if this is a good time to mention that most of them have left to go eat Italian while we are. I did notice that odd juxtaposition, but I do appreciate them greatly. I give special thanks to Nic Nicola and Julianne for all your myriad of phone calls, emails, instructions, and for your gracious accommodations and gifts that you have showered upon not only me, but my family. Truly and sincerely, we thank you. And to Sherry, a new friend whose brilliant scientific mind and exuberant belief in education inspires me, just as those we look to are supposed to inspire us. Sherry, it is a joy to be with you tonight. <laughs> to the teachers and the students who will be featured tonight, God bless you. Because the situation that we find ourselves in 50 years later has required strength, it has required knowledge, but mostly it has required bravery. May you be that path leader that follows in the footstep of these fine young people who started caring as children and have continued into parenthood and even grandparenthood. The history that you are presented, the questions that you are given, are the challenge to make you the person that needs to be in our lives so that you too may be our next president. Students, we appreciate and we admire you. I have addressed this remarkable association now since 1977, I think it was, when Debbie obviously fell across our, I don't even know if they had the word blog then. <laughs> they still won't let me near my computers in my business or my home, so. But I remember Deborah's call was, you will love these people. 
Although I want to tell you, most people don't understand what we're trying to do. I thought it was hyperbole until I realized that sadly, after my first visit with you, you were a group underestimated, underappreciated, and certainly under misunderstood. I have been thrilled to be part of you, even in a small way, for all of these years. I have met here, in this association, researchers, historians, medical professionals, skilled technicians, caring citizens of the world. What other group pulls together citizens who travel from foreign countries to celebrate the life of a man that led our country? Only JFK Lancer that I'm aware of. Beginning in 97, I have met people of intensity, compassion, and great determination. And it has brought me to the understanding that there's been a misunderstanding of semantics in our nation. The word conspiracy is not defined as an irrational or distorted emotional hysteria. Rather, it is a word meaning the efforts of more than one to create or conceal an action. Conspiracy exists, and you all know it better than most. The, ab the abusive terms of hysterics, doubters, or even the low nutcases that are thrown around are not proper synonyms for those that are theory-based, thinking individuals searching for truth and requesting honesty in the investigation of the events that followed the death of a United States president. It is a just cause, it is a quest of a critical community demanding the freedom so valued in this society and so necessary for its continuance. I thank you, deeply and honestly. Before I knew some of you, I understood the confusion of people that did not understand what you were seeking. But now I hope that the world, 50 years later, has realized that a murder mystery is never right and that the person taken from us is loved by other people. You stepped in and became protective, caring, and I love your demanding edge as well. In 97, I told you in my first speech to you that I had grown up as a child overhearing hushed conversations, phone calls not fully understood, that took place between my parents and my grandparents and my cousins. And I knew that when those calls took place, there was something to be secretive about. At the time of that speech, I was told by many following in the mainstream media, in the major authors who circled through our homes, that I had probably made a mistake and that I had come to the wrong place. When I returned home after receiving these calls, I asked my mother, Mary Lou, if I had in any way, I don't know, embarrassed or harmed anything. And instead of being the slightest bit concerned, she smiled, she looked at me with her beautiful blue eyes, blue as Jack's, they were the two with the matching color in the family. She took my hand and she looked across my shoulder to a picture of herself and Jack as children. And she said, no, darling, no, no. We all need to know who took him from us. And if these folks will do it, I will be grateful. I needed no other permission my only regret that she has left, but somehow I know that when you, through your efforts, through your cooperation, through your sharing of information, which is one of the most dynamic things I've seen about this group, 
You see men like Jim Douglas on the stage give credit for the fact that he technically put his book together on the thoughts and the work and the brilliance that you shared with all of us. Deborah has done it. Each of you has done it. To be part of this means you must be willing to look for that clue, that knowledge, that science, not for self-aggrandizement. And that is rare in the world that America has become. You are rare. And again, I thank you for that as well. Tonight, I thank my cousin, Robert Kennedy Jr., for I salute Bobby 16 years after I did it. At least he has stepped forward to do as I did, which is to share the truth about his father's feelings as I did about my mother's and some of her contemporary cousins. And in his endorsement of Douglas's book and others who he has now begun to encourage, may he and hopefully in some way me, give the strength to others who have for now two generations in my family discussed their concerns, their doubts, and their wishes. I hope that you will know that when that happens more and more, you are responsible for it. Our parents knew you were on the right course. They hoped that you would be there. Family obligation is one thing but the seeking of the truth was something else to some of them. Bobby and my mother were close. It does not surprise me that it is their children that step forth first. Also, we've been known to make some bad steps, so we do that occasionally. <laughs> we are not perfection, but we're pretty darn good people. Thank you for bringing out bravery in us. <laughs> Yesterday, one of the conferees said to me, I know you're related, I just don't know how you're related. <laughs> and here I am. It's a complicated question, which actually should be simple. And then he said, I'm so sorry. I said, I don't believe you questioned my lineage. Otherwise, you'll have ancestors from long ago come and chase you. We're Irish, we're very Banshee-like on that. <laughs> but if you really just want to know how we work, I will tell you quickly. Followed by his question, Patrick from Great Britain came and said to me, I'm fascinated by the research, but I'm more fascinated by the man, and I'm even more fascinated by the family. So I will quickly solve those questions and let you know that I too am fascinated by them. They read like a storybook success, half Titanic, I suppose half Queen Elizabeth and her family. For we have seen the lows and the heights. We have given in to hopes and dreams. We have lost, and sometimes in our defeats, we have learned more than we would have by our riches. Most of your families are probably the same way. In my case, my great-great-grandfather, Patrick Kennedy, sailed here from Wexford County, Ireland, from a little town named New Ross, where he left behind loving parents aunts and uncles, sisters, and a brother from a system that only allowed the firstborn son to inherit. Therefore, there was no hope that he could have the house or the farms, so he chose America to give it a try. He admitted later in a diary he was terrified, but once he got to the shores of Boston, he said, I thought perhaps there was hope because we weren't the most hated. <laughs> When, as a child, I questioned why this was good, my mother said, because where he had just come from, they were the most despised. And that is what we must always carry with us. Being at the bottom is wrong. Patrick brought that into his children. On his sail from England, he met his love. And he and Bridget were married soon after arriving. And they created children that have increased the Kennedy name and value just by being good people. His beautiful lady and Patrick produced four living children, and they included Patrick Joseph, their son, and their three daughters. In PJ, as he was called, or Pat's boy, he took his acumen, which was people, a little Irish whiskey, understanding how to vote, and beginning to organize. 
he became a wealthy man, a business owner, and an elected official. In his son, Joseph P. Kennedy, we see a man watching where his father came from, not afraid to admit that they had not started at the top, but in pretty good shape by that third generation came through here on our shores. Uncle Joe continued in his line of business and eventually realized he had chosen the wrong field. He wanted politics. Too late. When you're a millionaire, you've stepped on an awful lot of people. But as boys, they were ripe for coming up. In Joe Jr. and Jack, he saw the future, and he depended on his sisters, Loretta and Margaret, to help train them as their father had taught them, because their father, Senator P.J. Kennedy, never met a man he didn't care for, and kept as his motto above his desk, dear God, I come here but once. Let me do all the good I may before I come to be with you. And he lived by that. They took their nephews and taught them and introduced them to every neighborhood possible. These were boys of privilege and wealth, and they were made to understand that walking into a house with three generations of family with one bedroom was not anything to be embarrassed about, but rather something to admire. And so they grew in their own style, with Joe Jr. having the prevalent view. But as you know, Joe Jr. died. And Jack, skinny, scrawny, sticking his tongue out at the world, getting away with whatever, whatever mischief he could do, was all of a sudden in the spotlight. And every family member looked to him. And before you knew it, he could do it well. Nobody had more pride in John Fitzgerald Kennedy than John Fitzgerald Kennedy. <laughs> He learned how to be who he was supposed to be. In our family history, there are many gifts and there are many losses, as I say. But here tonight, 50 years after the death of my cousin Jack, the ultimate Black Friday anniversary of our childhoods, we couldn't be here without remembering him as a great president, at least to our family. And something must be going right for us, because just this week, CNN released a poll that seemed to stun them that 90% of Americans felt that Jack Kennedy should be at the top of the list. They had, I believe, bounced him down to 36. Not a good thing to do. The American people know who they liked. I have been remiss in introducing the rest of my family, and I am proud they are here with me tonight. It is the first visit for some, and a return visit after more than 15 years for another. My brother Kevin McCarthy is here. No, Kevin, not yet. Thank you, darling. Just stand there and act excited to hear from me. This will be good. Surprise, right? Yeah, well, he's a, he's a younger brother. He's used to, come here, no, don't bother, get over there. <laughs> we, not, we don't have as many children as Aunt Rose and Uncle Joe, but we're still good at that competition and pushing one another around. Kevin is a former federal law enforcement officer. He is a historian, a historical interpreter. He is currently still serving with the interior of the, uh, the Department of Interior United States National Park Service for almost 30 years and chose to approach his public service through quiet reverence of our land, our people, and our heritage. I'm proud to have you with me tonight. My sister Cheryl, although adopted into the family, shows many of the same personality traits. We refer to her quietly in loving moments within the family as the Terminator. She is an RN who you would want to save your life, but a family member that you avoid when she's in a bad mood at a family get-together. Cheryl was last with us in 98 when here in Dallas, where everybody told us you shouldn't go, it's not good for your family, we went to see the lovely gentleman that had stood on the railroad track, and because of his infirmities, with his loss of hearing and his inability to speak, people had stated that he wouldn't know what he had seen, that he wouldn't understand what had happened. He was hospitalized, Deborah told us, and we rushed to his side. We brought him gifts, we hugged him, and we thanked him, mostly. 
for being braver than the brave to keep fighting to tell the truth. It was an honor to get to know him. And as we left his hospital, we paused for an ambulance to go past us, and we were rear-ended and sent into the ambulance. My sister, the nurse, whose face dropped to here at, from the hit from the rear, said, stop that ambulance. I said, I found a unique way to do it. I'm allowing someone else to shove me into them, Cheryl. In the midst of what became traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injury, she fought back, pledging she would be here by the 50th. Just this year, she completed her last spinal surgery and survived breast cancer. She's here to stay. Now you know the Terminator. They saw you, darling. It's fine. Dear God, I thought you were going to stand through the whole rest of my speech. What are you doing? Okay, I mean, they saw you. That's good. And to my dear friend, Gary, who, who is an educator who couldn't wait to be here to find what Deborah and JFK Lanza, we've talked about it for years. His schedule never allowed it. And this year he said, heck with school, I'm going. Gary, who, thank you for being here finally after years of planning for it. You know, Jack Kennedy understood death. And someone said, why are you not filled with emotion of sadness and grief? I began it at the age of nine. As I begin my sixth decade on earth, I figure I paid tribute to Jack enough with tears. Better to be reminiscent of his humor, of his hopes, and of his dreams, because that's something we all shared in him. This focus that you place on him and solving his death does not mean that it's maudlin or sad, but rather it's something that Jack would have appreciated by the sheer fact that he lived to be 46. He grew in pain and sickness with my grandmother often being the one staying at his bed at the hospital, feeding him chocolate cake because he always ran at least 40 pounds underweight. He would say things like, gee, Aunt Loretta, you're the best aunt in the world. Falling, of course, for his charm, she would pull out another gift from his purse, at which point he would say, gee, Aunt Loretta, you're also the greatest godmother. Don't let it be said that Jack didn't know how to maneuver, manipulate, and enjoy. He did. But to those who loved him, they were ready for it. And America seems to have understood that, too. They understood that he achieved in pain, that he made mistakes, but he learned from experience. They learned that he learned as a hot war warrior to hate the death of our men and women as fodder for anger of old people who could not solve their problems with diplomacy. <laughs> he loved his children. His children brought a new facet and the loss of baby Patrick, which would have circled us back to the original Patrick I told you of, touched him beyond words. It changed him. There was new respect and affection between he and Jackie. There was a closeness that had been missing because of demands, because of his lifestyle, because the way America treats our presidents after this, they were porcelain and special and perfect. They weren't, but they were becoming that way again when we lost him. He lived and loved history and mythology, and who would think that his life would become part of both? But he would have loved it. I remember a beautiful summer day, 15 days, 15 years, excuse me, after his death, and Aunt Rose and I were walking the lawns of Hyannisport, and she turned and she looked to the ocean, and then she turned in a very pensive and almost way of contemplation, which usually when you were with Aunt Rose, it was constant talk and quizzing, and you felt exhausted as if you had done a thesis each day that you were with her. So I knew something was on her mind. It was a time of the AARB and the renewed interest in the assassination, and the results had just been replaced. And many people in the family assumed that Aunt Rose, as she hit her mid-80s, would not be interested in such things. She turned to me and said, what do you think of these hearings? What do you think of those results? And before I could answer, she said, and darling, do you think he heard her? I said, Aunt Rose, I'm not quite sure what topic we're on. I'm only in my 20s. I'm slowing down. And she said, darling, did Jack hear Jackie? Did he hear her final words? 
And I said, I believe so with all my heart, Aunt Rose. In that limousine, the world stopped for them. And as I said it to her, she said very softly, oh, I do so hope that's true, my dear. It will make me want to greet him more so that he did not feel that none of us were there with him. It is that connection to that family, to that man, to our feelings, which we often wear on our sleeves, that makes me so delighted that you all have spent these years also telling him you loved him, you respected him, you cared. You might not have even voted for him, but you damn well knew his death was wrong. So today, thank you. So today, in this place where the assassination happened, it looks as though we need to remind ourselves that this is a place of pilgrimage now, a growing, active, vital city, but one we visit, usually on this occasion, making it therefore a pilgrimage. And this city which did not cause his death but rather which embraced him and welcomed him with cheers and good wishes, spent his last day on earth with him. It is those people that often we forget are working at the sideline, not able to be with us tonight. And I thank them. For 50 years later, it is not solely an ending, but rather to me a reflective review of a life lived with purpose. And now we all share a purpose as well. His loss on November 22nd, to get back to the beginning of my story, impacted us as a family as it did you as an individual, you and your nation, whatever brings you here tonight with us. But it brought as much of an impact as did the death of that great, great grandfather I spoke of, for he too died on November 22nd, nine years after arriving in America. But through him, a proud lineage of people blessed with gifts and desires from a nation that welcomed them were also the same next generation unto the fifth to see the country mourn his loss. That is the greatest gift this country could have given the two men of the Kennedy family who left us on the 22nd of November. And I ask you to remember in your work his words given in 1959 as a candidate, this is not a time to keep the facts from the people, to keep them complacent. To sound the alarm is not to panic, but to ask and seek action from a roused public is leading your life in citizenship. For these 50 years, you have not failed his mandate you have sought the truth, and my family and I are proud to be with you tonight. God bless you all. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Oh, no. You got to thank you. You have many speakers to survive. Kevin. Now, Cheryl, Kevin, two seconds. Come up here. I thanked everybody in America. Thank you all. Thank you. I thanked everyone in America for getting me here. Stay here. But I forgot to mention my friend Deborah. I didn't really forget her. I'm just trying to be as tricky as she's always been with me. I value her for her dedication, for her caring, for her understanding and respect for each of you. And tonight, in that appreciation, we asked Deborah to accept from our family the etching on silk that hung in Jack and Jackie's family area of the White House, a gift to my grandmother, which is held with great pride in our family. My grandmother wouldn't even move it at Christmas. The Hummel crush set came out under it. Jack would have loved that. <laughs> Jackie sent it to my grandmother as a kindness for her, her lovingness of John and Caroline. It was given to the president. He chose it as one he liked. He moved it to the household area and to the family quarters. And then after Loretta, Aunt Loretta did something nice for the children, Jackie took it off the wall and sent it to her. And when Jack inquired, where's that 
etching I like from the Baccarat photo. Jackie said your Aunt Loretta wanted it. So we have treasured it, and we now share with you the way we maneuver in the family if somebody wants something or needs something. <laughs> Deborah, this is the true proof that you are family. We ask you to accept it. It has been appraised at a very high value, and you will be sh shortly receiving you will be shortly receiving the certificate from the collection and its verification. Thank you and join us. No, no, you, she can't sleep with it. It could lead to problems. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm trying to make you laugh. <laughs> thank you, Carrie, so very much. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much for your words of encouragement and love and, and strength to us tonight. I know that everyone was as moved as I was and, and our, our table here tonight. I also want to thank them. If you have a few minutes to look in the corner over there, there's also the family christening gown that she's brought for us to see, the Kennedy family christening gown, and also the patch that was, um, tell me, it, it, it was the PT109 patch. It's the B. Um, patch and it's over there framed and you're welcome to take a look at that and uh, and I appreciate you guys bringing that thank you again for your wonderful words 